seven oh one. There you go. We have um, we have a quorum of members, and so I would like to get going. Let's do it. Here's my as well. All right. Um, well, good evening. My name is Kate McCarthy. This is a meeting of the Montpelier Development Review Board. It's starting at seven o'clock on August third, twenty twenty. Um, I am the chair. My name is Kate McCarthy, and I will introduce uh, the other board members by reading their names and having them wave or say hello. So the other board members here tonight are Joe Kiernan, hello, hello. Kevin O'Connell, Jean Leon, Roger Cran, Rob Goodwin, here. I, don't know here. You can, I don't know if you can see oh. me, I'm having issues. <laughs> okay, we hear you. We don't see you yet, but we hear you. Thanks for being here, Rob. And Michael Azurta. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, but I'm already experiencing internet trouble, so this could be a fun night. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, knock on some wood and stay on the phone. How about that? <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for your efforts. Thanks for everybody's efforts participating in this format that we are coming to know and love. So also with us um, is Meredith Crandall. She is our zoning administrator and staff this committee. Um, Orca Media is recording tonight. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Meredith to do her staff review of how you can participate in this meeting if you're watching from home and how you can participate in this meeting if you're logged on. Okay, give me just a minute to get to the right file so that anybody who's watching via Orca can see how to get on. Um, okay, so my little overview here. So due to the state of emergency declared by Governor Scott as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and pursuant to Addendum 6 to Executive Order 0120 and Act 92, the Development and Review Board is authorized to meet electronically. There is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, um, in accordance with the temporary amendments to the Open Meeting Law, the Board is providing public access to the meeting by hosting a video conference meeting, including both video and telephone access options over the Zoom platform. There's also the option to view live streaming of the, media, of the meeting over Orca Media. Um, all members of the Board have the ability to communicate at the same time during this meeting through this platform, and the public has the ability to access and listen to if desired and if desired participate in this meeting in real time so you can if you're at home you can use this zoom meeting link here and put that in your browser or you can just call on the phone using this phone number and in either of those options here's the meeting id and password to log in i'll be leaving this up through the rest of this little spiel um, we did give notice to the public of this information and how to access the meeting previously in the public meeting notice. Um, it was both printed in the paper, posted throughout the city, um, and is also available on the city website here. Um, so if anyone has problems accessing the meeting, um, normally we'd have you contact a separate moderator. Today that moderator's not here, so you're gonna wanna email me, Meredith Crandall, at mcrandall, that's C-R-A-N-D-A-L-L, -L, at montpelier-vt.org um, and then I can help you log in. Also, if you're already in the meeting and you're having technical difficulties through the Zoom conference, um, you can use the chat function to message me separately. Um, but try in any private chat with me, try and keep that just for technical difficulties. Anything that's actually questions for, um, the, the meeting in general is part of the public hearing part. Please have that, if you're going to use chat, have that be in the chat. Um, and this is so for people who are on here for the first time um, or people who are watching via ORCA and want to log in. Um, if you log in, you um, have the opportunity to tell me which applications you wish to comment on. I've already checked in with the new people we have on tonight about that. Um, and so when the chair announces that the time for public comment on a particular application arrives, um, then you can either unmute yourself or I'll unmute you and call people um, or 
Kate might call people and then I'll unmute you. Um, you know, based on when you submitted your, um, you know, your order, your intent to talk. Um, if you are interested in speaking and didn't previously say that you wish to do so, if it's a different application and you may have a comment, um, please raise your hand on video. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine and that should act as a raising your hand in the Zoom meeting. Um, you can also, if that's not working, you can unmute yourself and just say, hey, and, and I have something I want to say on this matter, but please make sure you're waiting till the public comment period. Um, for those of you who haven't done these public comments before, once the chair has recognized you to participate and you're unmuted, you're free to provide your comments. We're asking you two minutes initially. There may be follow-up questions from the, the board, in which case you, know, you can have follow-up comments, but initial question, comments, please limit to two minutes. Um, after you've finished, please mute your microphone, and this actually goes for everybody, if at all possible. If you're not talking, please mute yourselves to avoid background noise or interference. It's hard for everybody to hear. Um, in the event the public is unable to access this meeting, then it's going to be continued to a time and place certain. I will be keeping an eye on my email to see if anybody's having trouble logging in or in case something happens with Orca. Um, and I think I've covered everything there. Oh, if you are on the phone and you don't have a mute button on your phone itself, you can also press star six on your phone and just mute yourself there within Zoom. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by a roll call vote. I'm going to now hand this back over to Kate. You're muted, Kate. Uh, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda, um, which we'll do by roll call. Are there any modifications to the agenda? All right. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second by Rob. All right. We'll tell. We'll take the roll. Uh, or any discussion? All right. We will take the roll call. Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Dean. Roger. Yes. Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I also vote yes. All right. We've approved our agenda. Um, the next item on the agenda is the election of the chair and vice chair. Our DRB procedures say that we do this annually in August. And um, as I'll mention later as well, we do not have a second August meeting. So we're going to do that now. So um, we have not discussed this as a board. Um, I would take nominations for chair. I'll, I'll, I'll make the nomination for chair uh, for uh, Kate. Um, uh, Yes, I'm, I'm nominating you as chair. Thank you. I second that. There. Right there. I second. We have a um, thank you. A motion from Kevin, and I think I heard the first second was from Joe. Um, is there any discussion? Yeah, hey, Kate, this is Michael. Didn't we already like approve you as chair recently? That, that's a good question. Yes. What happened was that our sitting chair, Dan Richardson, was appointed to city council um, right before the March election to fill a, a, the end part of a vacant seat. And so we had a vote and an, um, at that time to kind of fill out the remainder of his term, which would have ended in August. Oh, um, and now we're... Right. And, and I just I just want to say... We don't get to... That's fine. I guess I'm just confused on... I thought we had a second vote where we like reaffirmed your appointment. Okay. I don't recall. I was vice chair before and um, then I was acting chair and we may have affirmed me as chair chair um, after Dan left the board. I, I, um, I just, so this, what we're voting for now is the next year. Right. And, and August is typically the time when we do that. And there, there have been so many disruptions this year that, you know, we may have taken another, 
you know, half dozen uh, different different votes on these okay. kinds of things. But right, right. now is what matters. And I just want to say, Kate has has really grabbed the ropes of this of this process, particularly in this uh, uh, strange situation we find ourselves right now. And I just would uh, like to see that uh, uh, expertise that Kate has uh, has gained uh, continue as uh, uh, in the chairman uh, position, chairperson position. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate that. It's uh, it's certainly been a team effort, and I've been glad to do my part. Um, any other discussion? Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Uh, Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yay. Jean. Yes. Roger. Yes. Rob. Yes. Uh, Michael. Yes. And I'm going to abstain. Um, thank you all. You have elected a chair for the next year, and it continues to be me. I really, really appreciate your support. All right, so what we will do next is um, accept nominations for the vice chair for the next year. Are there nominations for a vice chair? I nominate uh, Kevin. I second. Motion by Roger, second by, I think that was Jean, right? Yes. Okay, thank you, Jean. Is there any discussion? Uh, all right, we'll take the vote. Joe? Yes. Uh, Kevin? Abstain. Jean? Yes. Roger? Yes. Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I also vote yes. Congratulations, Kevin, and thank you for continuing on as vice chair. Thank you, everybody. All right. I appreciate the vote of confidence. Thank you. Great. Um, there are no comments from the chair. I believe the next item is our meeting minutes um, to approve the meeting minutes of July 20th. The people eligible to vote are Kevin, Rob, Joe, Michael, Roger, and myself. So is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Motion by Rob. Second. Second, Second by Kevin. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, of those eligible to vote, Kevin. Yes. Rob? Yes. Joe? Yes. Michael? Yes. Roger? Yes. And I also vote yes. We've approved the minutes of July 20th. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll move to our first application of this evening, which is a continuation from two meetings ago of 100 East State Street. So before I ask Meredith to recap where we left off and what we need to figure out tonight, I will ask if there's anyone new here to testify on this application, 100 East State Street. Okay, so Meredith, could you um, review the status of the application and outstanding issues? Uh, I can, but it looks like we lost our applicant. I think Yana got okay. disconnected. All right. Huh. I don't see a, a square, a rectangle for Yana, but I'll ask anyway. Yana, are you still there? Okay. Let's check the email. I don't see anything from Yana there. She was here. I spoke to her. Yes, we, we heard her. Um, Meredith, what do you recommend? Um, well, we can, we could, you know, give her a couple minutes to see if she gets back on. We could also mm -hmm. move to a hundred, you know, to the, to the pump track, deal with that one first mm -hmm. and then go, mm -hmm. oh, wait, wait, I think this is probably Yana. Hold on. Yana, are we welcoming you back?
is the person joining us on the phone, Yana. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm uh, in the middle of the woods. I apologize. <laughs> Oh, so, never apologize for being in the middle of the woods, as far as I'm concerned, but thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah, if you can mute me, there are a lot of people around me. Thanks. Oh, well, All right. we're going to start on door. <laughs> on door. Oh. Yeah, I just muted you, Yana, but we're going to discuss your application. We'll let you know um, when it's time for you to, when you can talk, and then I'll unmute you. Great. So with that, we'll get um, an overview from Meredith. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is hit a couple of the big issues that were resolved. So we know those, my understanding is that those are dealt with um, and they go into the new information and then um, provide, because I didn't do a full staff report update, I will list what I suggest um, for conditions of approval, assuming that the board approves the application, uh, because those are slight, maybe slightly changed from the original staff report. So during the July 6th hearing on the 100 East State Street application, which is to um, demolish a small shed on the back of a garage, of a historic garage, the shed isn't historic, um, and then convert that garage into a single dwelling unit. Um, so during the July 6th hearing, the board determined that this project is not demolition of a historic structure, and so isn't subject to the elevated requirements of section 3004.D. Um, and the board also took um, testimony regarding screening of the new dwelling unit from the commercial business on the site. And my understanding is that um, it uh, was decided that they didn't need necessarily additional landscaping between those two structures, but the board might have changed their mind by then. Like I said, this is just my understanding of what happened. Um, and then the outstanding issue was whether or not the public sidewalk requirement of section 3202.B1 was applicable. Um, at the board's direction, I went to the city attorneys and got guidance on that. There's the my short memo and then the legal guidance from the attorneys in the meeting packet. Um, and based on that guidance, um, I have recommended that the board waive the public sidewalk requirement for this particular application because the city's attorneys had advised that the requirement would be unconstitutional if administered and enforced as written, particularly in this particular instance where the project costs and the scale of the project are so small in relation, in relation to the amount of sidewalk that would be required and the associated costs with that. Um, so my sort of upshot of all of that um, is that my recommendation would be that um, if the board agrees with all of those items that for um, approving the, the application conditions would include that the applicant shall follow the erosion control practices outlined in section 3008D, and that also within 30 days of this decision um, and prior to permit issuance, that the applicant shall provide the zoning administrator with the full specifications for the proposed outdoor light fixtures, including the lumen output, um, which demonstrate compliance with the requirements of section 3204. I think both of those were listed in the back of the staff report. I just wanted to make sure we reiterated them. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, ask board members if you have any questions on the determination about the sidewalk requirement. We've received legal advice from outside counsel and staff recommendation not to enforce that provision of the zoning bylaw because it was found to be um, inappropriate um, it, it could be considered a taking. Um, I agree with staff recommendation in this, but I want to take a few minutes and provide space to ask any questions that people might have about that recommendation, uh, board, that board members might have about that recommendation. Roger. Um, I, I uh, agree with the recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Kevin. 
Yeah, and I, I, I do as well. And I think it, it's uh, incumbent upon us to show some flexibility. I mean, we live in a, in a, uh, a city with very old infrastructure and uh, uh, we're just maintaining a status quo in this instance. Okay, I see some nodding. Any other questions or comments about this recommendation regarding the sidewalk? Um, just for our future reference, at the end of the meeting where we discussed this, Joe asked a very good question, which was, does this sidewalk actually terminate? Because it, there's a crosswalk that goes over to another perfectly good sidewalk. And what we learned is that um, termination, a, a, a crosswalk is a termination point even though it seems like it has connectivity. So that's just a fun fact about our zoning, interpretation of it, um, coming out of Joe's good question on July 6th. Okay, um, so are there questions about any of the other issues that we discussed, that, that Meredith mentioned, or that we discussed on July 6th? Um, we've, I think, determined quite conclusively it's not a demolition of a historic structure. We talked about screening. Are there any other um, any other pieces of information you need to be able to deliberate and make a decision on this? Okay, and um, I feel like the board is is pretty well informed. Yana, is there anything that you want us to know or um, be aware of before we before we deliberate on this? Hello? Hello. Oh, yeah. There has been no changes to our application. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, in that case, what I'm going to propose is that uh, in order to move things along and in order to just let the board put the finishing touches on these conditions, I'm going to propose that we move this into a deliberative session um, at the end of this meeting. And I'm going to need help from staff to remind me what the exact motion is when we decide to do a deliberative session. We are closing the public hearing. Is that right? Um, if, if, if we're not coming back, then yes. For this one, it would be closing the public hearing, um, a motion to close the public hearing, and move into a deliberative session at the end of the public portion of tonight's meeting. If that's what you're choosing to do at the end of tonight versus a different day. And, and I, I, you, I see that you've thrown the ball in the air and I'll catch it <laughs> and and I'll make that motion. Motion by Kevin. Second that motion. Second by Rob. All right, we'll vote. Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Dean. Yes. Roger. No. Rob. Yes. Michael. Yes. All right, and I also vote yes. The motion carries. Thank you. All right, with that, we have concluded our discussion of 100 East State Street, and we're going to move on to Zero Cummings Street, the North Branch Park Pump Track. Um, uh, Meredith. Meredith. Sure yeah. Yana understands what's going on. Um, so that, so, so, um, maybe you're not planning to come back from the deliberative session tonight. It will be, Yana will get a written decision with what happens with what the actual vote is and conditions later, correct? That's right. That's right. So we won't be discussing this application anymore in public tonight. So if, if Yana wants to sign off, that would be fine. Okay. Thanks. And I, I would like to say before you do sign off, Yana, we are, I'm not suggesting deliberate discussion because there are any problems with this application, but rather to expedite the creation of the conditions and the discussion that we're having as a relatively new board. Okay. Nothing wrong with the project. All right. Okay, that's good. That sounds good to me. Good. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to move on to the North Branch Park pump track. And I believe we have the. Oh, Meredith, yeah. Sorry, we had somebody else just come on on the phone, and I don't know who it is. It might be Ward. Ward. It's Ward Joyce. Hi, Ward. Hey. Um, Am I we, we just wrapped up 
um, 100 East State Street and are moving on to our next application, but there were no questions from board, this is Kate speaking, there were no questions from board members about the specifics of the project, and Yana shared that there were no changes to the project since the July 6th meeting. Okay, great. Yeah. So that means we move, we move forward. Yes, we're going to we're going to make that final vote in a deliberative session after the public portion of this meeting is closed. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Bye. Bye. All right. Great. All right. So um, we're turning to 100 East State Street, and my first question before I ask Meredith to tell us where it's at is, I'm going to ask if there's anyone new here to testify on this application. Yeah, on the zero coming street home track. That's, that's totally what I that is absolutely what I meant. Yes. We're not gonna we're going to talk about the pump track, zero cummings. Is there anyone new to testify on that application? Um, I'm Noel Langwell. I'm just here along with John Hollard in case you have questions about it. I'm with the Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association. Okay. So Nolan, if you think you might be answering questions, I need to put you under oath. Um, since that what you say will be entered into there you go, entered into the record. So do you solemnly swear or affirm to, that the evidence you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yeah. Great. Thanks, Nolan. Okay. Um so I want to note uh, yes. Kate, I'm sorry, it's John Jose. Uh, do you need to hear from me again or am I no longer considered to be new? You are no longer considered to be new. You remain under oath. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for checking. Thanks for checking. So um, I believe, um, Jean, you were not present last week to hear this application. Is that correct? That's correct. I've been reading okay. the staff reports and following up on the, on the agendas here. Okay, great. And just confirm that you, you feel prepared to, to hear this this evening? I, I think I've read quite enough and, and seeing the applicants uh, request and the reports and the comments so yes wonderful thanks thanks for taking the time to get prepared um i want to disclose that i made a site visit this evening um to the site that we're discussing um in order to better wrap my head around the um, characteristics of the land especially when it comes to the wetland questions um did anyone else um make any visits or have any ex parte communications Okay, so Meredith, um, would you please recap where we are with this application? Or, or I can, so to you. Um, I can to at least a degree. Um, as everybody knows, I wasn't here for the hearing, but I did actually go through and listen to the whole thing um, and take notes. So um, what um, I, just to, if we've got people on here, but so this application is for building a pump track um, on a parcel of land that adjoins the Winooski River or the North Branch of the Winooski River that's owned by the city um, and it's often managed in large part by the Parks Department. Um, but this pump track would be built by the um, Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association. And through uh, the hearing two weeks ago, um, the main topic of discussion appeared to be the wetlands and vernal pool issues. Um, there was significant discussion and testimony on that. Um, and some of the big issues were concerns regarding barriers to amphibian migrations and how to prevent runoff snow melt into the wetlands um, and the potentially uh, potential contaminants included in that snow melt, as well as a question regarding, it seemed like there was questions regarding whether or not the board was going to approve some or all of the parking that was proposed um, that seemed to be a, an issue as well um so there have been um comments since that july 20th hearing um there were some that i included in the updated packet that was posted and circulated as part of the agenda um, including some from the montpelier director of parks uh, Alec Ellsworth. Um, his comments were with regard to whether or not he thought that screening was needed between this new use and the, especially the local um, apartments, the nearby apartments, the determination regarding impervious surfaces, winter use, um, that this would not be used in the winter, confirmation of that. 
um, and some thoughts about impacts on wetlands and vernal pools. Um, and there was also some discussion that I circulated between um, John Jose and the planning director, Mike Miller, with regard to potential conditions to deal with the amphibian issues. Um, in addition, and I circulated these um, to the board members and to John Holler, I've received comments since then, since the staff report got circulated, and I can read those into the record when we get to that point. I'm not going to do that now, um, but those are from Ned Swan. Um, and the Montpelier Conservation Commission. Um, you let's, let's get a little more oriented before you read those into the record. Exactly. I don't want to read those now. That would be later. Okay. Um, do you, you know, I there seems to be a long list of potential conditions for this application, and I don't know if you want me to go through this, Kate, or if that's something that we should hold off on, just because the wetlands issue seems fairly unresolved right now to me, but maybe yeah. Let's let's um, just confirm our understanding of the issues before we talk about conditions. Um, so just one thing I want to say for the record, and this, this comes up every few meetings, um, it's, it's just kind of a reminder about what we do and what we don't do. Um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I wish that a project had this or didn't have this, or do we need one of these, or do we need two of those? And um, that comes up all the time. Um, but I just want to remind us um, and for the, for the listeners that it, it's not the DRB's decision to decide who, who a project should be for or whether it should be done or not be done. Our, our job is to take what's been proposed and then make sure it fits, um, fits the standards that we have in our regulations. So that's going to be our job tonight. Um, um, we'll do to the best of our ability. So. Um, after going to the site and after reflecting on our discussion last week, I thought it could be valuable if we just talked a little bit about what is and is not present with respect to the proposal, um, how the proposal relates to the wetlands and vernal pools. And I want to remind folks that we have two resources, uh, resource maps that we're looking at. We have the ANR Natural Resources Inventory, which is page 86 of our packets. We also have the um, City of Montpelier Natural Resource Inventory, um, which is um, not necessarily more fine grained, but may have another uh, an additional amount of on the ground surveying that's been done by the Conservation Commission in the city. So the recommendations in our staff report from Meredith um, initially come from her assessment of the NRI, which Natural Resources Inventory, which shows that this project is within the 500 foot vernal pool buffer and then the 50 foot wetland buffer. Um, our job as a board when it comes to the standard for protecting wetlands and vernal pools is to determine whether there is an undue adverse impact on those resources. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a landscape. So what I'd like to do, if, if you all wouldn't mind, I, I think it would be a benefit. Um, Meredith, could you sh please show us page 86 of the staff report, which is the, um, it's the, Pump Shock Natural Resources map from the ANR Natural Resources Inventory. Okay, if you want to zoom that up a little bit. So the red part is what's a mapped wetland from the Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory. And I don't know if you can zoom that at all. You're probably trying right now, Mary. I can't hear you, but I know you're trying. Um, and then the wetlands advisory layer, um, I had to look that up. I wanted to understand what it is. It's according to ANR, Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, it's the most up-to-date non-jurisdictional wetlands mapping available to the public and to ANR staff. So it may not have been part added yet to the official inventory, but there are areas that are known to have the qualities of a wetland. Um, so Meredith, I guess you're, um, are you able to zoom it all there? I'm zooming in on my screen. So okay, my, maybe it's okay for others. Uh, your screen sharing is paused. Hold on. Let me try it again, because for some reason it okay, said paused. There we go. There we go. So I'm just I'm just showing this in order to refresh our memory. Um, so you've got the parking that's between the road to the apartments, which is Cumming Street, and the pump track itself. The pump track with, with is um, far away from the main part of the wetland. I I note that 
that's shown on the map. It's also my personal observation from being there today. Um, that long skinny rec rectangle just beneath the pump track, thank you, Vanna, um, is a ditch um, that I think we've received testimony provides some um, passage, riparian right 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 passage for critters. So um, the application is for the pump track. The snow storage that is shown is we here either a historic or existing use by the city. Um, and so as we're contemplating the impacts to wetlands, we are looking at what the applicant may be responsible for um, in, in avoiding undue adverse impacts on the wetlands. So I, I just thought that I would provide that overview um, because I thought it would be useful to ground us in our discussion. Um, are there any questions about this map from board members? Okay, what is the red again? Sure, so that is noted as a class one wetland um, from the Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory. And just by looking at that, this is not a scientific assessment so much as a layperson's observation. Um, I think we can assume that some of those functions have been compromised because there are houses in the wetland. Um, there's obviously been some fill and some building in those areas, but it's, it's a mapped wetland. Um, we heard from the testimony of the state expert submitted by the applicant that um, it's not a jurisdictional, it's not jurisdictional. So it doesn't, it's not pulled into the state wellness program. Hold on one second. Are you sure that that's not the AE 1% annual flood line? Um, oh. Yeah, I think the that class one's orange. Yeah. Oh gosh, you have better eyes than I do, Rob. Thank you for that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> team effort, team effort. Okay, so I want to correct the record that I'm not saying that there's a wetland in the middle of those houses, um, but that is the um, flood hazard area. So the wetlands advisory is what we're talking about there. I'm glad we're talking about this because that's important. Um, are there questions or comments about the um, the the map, the extent of the wetland, how it relates to the proposed um, project. Okay, so just for comparison, if we could zip over to page 101 of the packet, I just want folks to see the, um, there it is, the natural resource inventory for the city. Um, what we're looking at there is the kind of uh, yellow, darker yellow, that's the 500, foot buffer around the vernal pool. The darker green is the wetland. The lighter green around it is the 50 foot buffer. Okay. And then um, could you outline for us the approximate location, Meredith, of the pump track and the parking area? Okay, so they're kind of down in that part of it. Okay, so that's that's what we're contemplating. That's the extent of the impact that we're discussing tonight. Okay. So everything just presented is my understanding of the materials. And at this point, I want to open it up um, to board members to ask if you have any, any other questions about, about what we just looked at. Just want to make sure we all understand what we're talking about. OK. Um, so like I said, our standard is to determine whether there's an undue adverse impact to that. Um, we've heard from the state wetland specialist that constructing a buffer between the wetland uh, to demarcate the 50 foot buffer of the wetland so that people don't accidentally ride their bikes into that area. Um, that would be, I think, to the east of the of the pump track. Um, we also heard testimony about the functions of that wetland in terms of the area being used for um, amphibians to move from the vernal pool into the wetland toward the riparian area. Um, and so we heard testimony that the, the barriers themselves, Jersey barriers, would, would hinder small amphibians. Um, and so would construction during amphibian migration season. Um, I'm going to stop because I'm, what I've just done is kind of make sure we had a shared understanding and recounted my sense of what we talked about in the um, last meeting. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for discussion. Or, um, 
Actually, maybe what I'll do is have Meredith read into the record comments that pertain to this um, this part of the application. Would that be all right, board members, or do you have some burning questions and clarifications you'd like to ask? No, I think that I think that works works well. Okay. Yeah, Gene, did you have a question? Are there any other recommendations from any other groups um, regarding the buffering? I mean, considering where this is, uh, and and so during mud season access, what's going to prevent this pump track from becoming a mud track? Mm -hmm. Maybe I would let the um, maybe I'd turn that over to John Holler to answer um, to recap, make sure we all understand the seasonality or the the, the time that this wouldn't wouldn't be. Sure. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So thank you. I, I had uh, uh, an opportunity to think about the issues that came up during the last hearing, as well as to have a number of conversations with people about some of these issues. So hopefully I can help advance the discussion. Um, so I guess the first issue, I'll just start with the construction that is intended to be either this summer or early fall. So I think it will be outside the amphibious migration season. So I think we can um address that issue um but let me just i guess run through the what i heard was the four conditions or issues that were outlined by the chair at the end of the last meeting and the first one was that was the construction question and whether this would occur outside the um, uh, migration season of amphibians and that i understand is uh, early spring the intent is to build a pump track uh, this summer or early fall so i think we can we can I guarantee that we're going to avoid that period. Um, the second issue was uh, a question about whether to impose a condition that would require a buffer between the pump track and the wetland. So I'll come back to that. Uh, the third was la a landscaping condition. A landscape. It wasn't clear to me whether that was limited just to parking or whether it was a consideration of landscaping for the pump track itself. And then there was a discussion or a listing of several standard conditions, erosion control plan, state permits, and then a parking plan. Um, so let me just run, I'd like to just, if I could run through those really quickly. Um, so in terms um, of construction, John, I think I'm addressing. John, if, yeah. I could if I could interrupt you for a second, I want to make sure we don't lose Gene's question about um, whether this turns into a mud pit um, in March. Um, and then if, if you would maybe start with the, yeah, and then if you would briefly address those other things. We haven't introduced the reintroduced the parking and screening topic, but um but sure, go go ahead with with that after you've maybe let us know okay. about um Thank whether you. this becomes a mud yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh the pump track is is gonna be constructed with dirt, but it's gonna be compacted earth with uh I think a significant amount of clay content. The idea is that this is gonna be a, a structure that lasts for many years, a decade perhaps. Um, we're spending $8,500 to build this. The only material is dirt. If it washes away, our investment's gone, the project's gone. So the idea is to create a structure that's going to last. So if you look at, and, and this is not new, there are pump tracks all over Vermont. They're built to last for a period of time. You know, I don't know how much, I mean, I could say certainly at least a decade, but perhaps longer. So, but they're not built to wash away because otherwise they wouldn't be, there'd be no point in, in building them. Um, so just to run through the other issues, uh, there was a discussion about erosion control plan. That's not a problem. We can meet those requirements that are required, that are uh, uh, was identified in the zoning ordinance that I've talked to, um, to our, the, the builder and we would submit a plan to the uh, DPW for approval. Um, in terms of landscaping, um, you know, we're not convinced that that's needed for the, for the parking, but if it is, if the commission determines that the housing needs to be screened from the parking area, which would be a maximum of nine spaces, I think we could do that. Um, we don't think that it's warranted to screen the entire pump track. I think it's useful to think of this as almost like a playground. This is really designed for young people, for young bikers. And just like you wouldn't want to screen a playground from a nearby community, I think it would be inappropriate to screen this from the neighborhood. Alec Ellsworth, the Parks Commissioner, may have submitted comments to that effect. I've talked to him about this. 
but it just seems like bad community planning to screen off an area that young people are going to be using from the area that adults are going to be. Um, we want we want people to be able to see what's going on there. Um, let's see. So, um, oh, the other issue that I wanted to address was the wetlands wetland buffer. Um, so the builder intends to build uh, a, a buffer area to demarcate the area that separates the pump track from the surrounding area. So it would be a, a small berm, six to 10 inches with vegetation planted on top of it. The area surrounding that will continue to be uh, a consistent vegetative growth. That's not gonna be disturbed during the construction. So I don't expect that you're gonna have people biking through it. Um, Okay, if you, vis you visited the site, you saw it's pretty overgrown. Nobody's going to be biking through that. They're tall weeds. It's an overgrown area. It's going to continue to look like that. Um, so I don't think there's a great risk of that, but there would be a buffer that would be created. So the area is clearly going to be demarcated. Um, what I'm concerned about, though, is imposing a requirement on the applicant to prevent future runoff of uh, snow storage that if the city decides to use the site to place snow there. My understanding is that hasn't happened for seven or eight years. They may use it again for that purpose. If they do, it's a decision that's entirely out of our hands and entirely independent of whether a pump track exists there or not. So putting that burden or that requirement on uh, the applicant on this uh, to ensure or protect against any runoff from the city's decision to place snow on the site seems to be a, a reach. I think that's more appropriately a requirement of the city to ensure that any snow that they put on the site doesn't run off into the river. Um, and John, on, on that point, I think that was a recommendation of the state wetland specialist rather than a staff recommendation. Okay. And I, you and know, Meredith, I, I is, totally that, is that your understanding as well, Meredith? Uh, that's where it came from. That's where it came from. Um, okay. I, included it in here is a possible condition to consider because it was put in there. The other thing to remember is that yes, Mamba is on here as the applicant, but these are zoning permits, they run with the land. So ultimately the city, the city is ultimately responsible for what happens on the piece of property. Just if that's any help for you, John. Um, sure. Something that's well, out there. I mean, I'm not, but this this is city property, so I'm not sure how this application changes that. I mean, we're happy to be responsible for the impacts that are created by the construction of the pump track. What I'm concerned about is being responsible for future actions of the city in placing snow on the site that we can't control. Yeah, and I, so I, the whole yeah. Go ahead, Kate. No, you, you go ahead, please. <laughs> I was just saying, I mean, the, the, your application is for the pump track. The snow storage that's occurring there is not what's being permitted here. You've just noted on here what is a, a current use of the site. So that's not part of the approval. Is that where you were going as well, Kate? Basically, and also, um, Mamba is not buying the land from the city. It's, uh, it's improving the land that the city owns, right? Do I have that right, John? That's right. Okay. This is just a, a permitted use from the, by the city. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Good food for thought. And thank thank you for that. And I I know you you have a nice list that you're going through, John. And I'm kind of jumping in with questions as we go, but that's that's how how it rolls sometimes. Oh, so um, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, I'm really finished. Well, let me say I'm finished. One last thing, I did have a conversation. I think John Jose maybe hopefully still on the phone. John and I talked. I encouraged him to look at the Waterbury pump track. Um, I've talked to the builder about whether this the pump track would impede the migration of amphibious amphibian uh, creatures, and I'm told that it really does. That it doesn't have the kind of any kind of steep barriers or or. Uh, um, dips that would be that barrier and so um, I guess you may hear from John but we've tried to try to address that concern okay all right great well I think what I'd like to do next is um, if John Jose has anything new to add um, distinct from last time 
Um, he appeared. I'll, I'll give two minutes for that, and then I will have Meredith read the new evidence into the record, and then we'll open up for DRB discussion. So, John, Jose, I would turn it over to you for about two minutes if you have new evidence. Or yes. Comment, comment. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, as John indicated, he had suggested I visit or give consideration to visiting a pump track that's located up in Waterbury. Um, this track was designed and built, my, my understanding is, by Sinuosity, the same company that is going to design and construct the pump track on Cumming Street. And I did take a drive up and take a look at uh, the track and take some pictures yesterday. And I feel that assuming the track on Cumming Street will be built in a similar fashion to the track in Waterbury. In the overall scheme of things, I don't see any major concerns that the track would halt amphibian migration in that area. It certainly may affect migration, as just about any structure built on that site would, but I certainly don't foresee it stopping the movement of amphibians through that kind of uh, travel corridor and effect they have there. That being said, I did note along some portions of the track, including at both extreme ends where the track does a 180 degree turn, the track approaches a near vertical or vertical aspect and effect creating a wall at some points. And I would just ask that sinuosity do whatever they can to minimize the occurrence of these vertical or near vertical portions of the track whether it be at the ends of the track or in other locations along the track. That being said, I certainly would not want to see sinuosity compromise the integrity, the functionality, nor the safety of the track in doing so. And that's the extent okay. of uh, comments I had, Kate. Great, thank you. Thank you, John, I appreciate that. Um, uh, maybe I'll pause there and see if there are any specific questions um, from board members for John Jose or John Holler. Okay, well, let's go ahead and hear from the um, hear from Meredith, who will read to us the um, items submitted today, so that they're in the record. Okay, and so. Because these have not been posted to the city website, I'm going to read these. It's going to take a little bit, um, but these will also get in, you know, included in the permit file. If anybody from the public or out there wants copies of these, they can contact me and I can provide them. Um, so first we have a letter that was submitted, um, e emailed in by Paige Gurdon and who was on um, at the hearing last time. And, uh, but these comments are actually from the Montpelier Conservation Commission. So we, the undersigned, are members of the Montpelier Conservation Commission. So our comments come from that perspective, although they are not made on behalf of the entire commission. This project is def definitely within the 500 foot protection area around the Vernal Pool. However, it's possible that the project will not have a direct impact on the pool itself given that A, the project site is on the other side of the road and away from the woods, and B, the land and vegetation on the proposed site are not of the type that would be likely to support the amphibians that would utilize the vernal pool as a breeding ground during the rest of the year. There is, however, a wetland on the opposite side of the project site, and amphibians such as wood frogs have been observed both breeding in the wetland and moving back and forth between the wetland and the vernal pool. The state requires a 50 foot buffer to be maintained around the wetland. Both the wetland and the vernal pool need to be protected during construction and people should be made aware of the use of those areas by sensitive amphibians during spring and early summer. We ask that the following conditions be placed on the permit. Construct the pump track in late summer or fall to minimize interference, uh, sorry, one, construct the pump track in late summer or fall to minimize interference with amphibian movement and breeding. Two, mark the 50 foot buffer around the adjacent wetland with tape or rope and signs before construction begins to be sure it's not encroached upon. Three, provide erosion control between, between the project and the river slash wetland during construction. 
Four, take steps to protect the wetland from runoff and people walking or riding into it. This could include wire fencing around the perimeter of the track or preferably planting native vegetation along the river end of the track to encourage bikers to stay on the track. This would also mitigate runoff from the raised area and control erosion. Five, create as little disturbance as possible of the native soil, given that it is very likely contaminated with petroleum products and other pollutants from years of being used as a snow dump site and will spread those contaminants to the wetland and river if disturbed. Six, use only pervious gravel for the parking lot if the lot is necessary at all, not paving, and screen the lot with appropriate vegetation that does not disturb amphibian migration patterns. Seven, the applicant should have a plan to close the track to the public based on weather or seasonal closures. This should include signage at the track or parking lot notifying the public that the track is closed. We ask the DRB to determine why a parking lot is needed at all when there is a paved dead end road adjacent to the proposed site that is wide enough for cars to park and city trucks to pass by. And the applicant stated that access to the site will be primarily from the recreational path and adjacent parking lot, adjacent, sorry, public parking. If the parking lot were eliminated, the applicant could locate the pump track away from the wetland area and closer to the road reducing the impacts to the vernal pool, wetland, and vulnerable amphibian rate populations. Respectfully, Montpelier Conservation Commission members Paige Gurton, Phyllis Rubenstein, Michael Lazorchak, Stephanie Hunt, Katie Michaels, uh, Jamie Bates. Um, and then we have... Um, oh, Meredith, can I interrupt you for a second? Or maybe maybe I'm going to ask Michael. Are you are you the same Michael Lazorchak as signed on to that letter? No, I didn't sign on to the letter, but I I don't assume there's another Michael Lazorchak running around Montpelier. Ah, uh, so so they put your name on this without you knowing. Um, we yeah yeah. I mean, I I knew obviously I knew from because Paige had asked about the last meeting but um not th yeah this letter isn't my doing okay i would like to just jump in and ask you michael do you, yeah. do you endorse the uh the issues that are discussed in the letter or do you disavow them um well i respect uh john jose's opinion he's uh very passionate about this issue and as far as I can tell knowledgeable and it sounds like you know whatever I'm very comfortable about the project and, and personally the only question I have outstanding is I, I still haven't got a clear answer on the number of parking spaces the applicant wants which doesn't have anything to do with the letter so okay we'll move to that next so um, I guess for the sake of for the applicant's benefit and for the other board members, um, though your name is on that letter, it doesn't mean that you're um, necessarily behind all of those requests. Right, uh, but I am an active member of the Conservation Commission. Okay, great, thanks. That might have been overkill to ask you that. I just thought it would be important to talk it through a little bit. Thank you. Um, all right, Meredith, there's one more letter. Yes, there is. Um, so this is to the Montpelier Development Review Board from Ned Swanberg, Montpelier resident, dated July 31st, 2020, regarding the proposed pump park on Cummings Street. Thank you for considering my comments during the recent hearing. I'm afraid this is going to be another hasty and inadequate response, but here are some of my thoughts. One, the North Branch River Park has been, sorry, that's what I done, has been recently transformed by the new mountain bike trail system. What had been a place for quiet wildlife and nature centered activities has now become a fast, active adventure, stunt and exercise park. I can understand how yet another accoutrement to this new project can be unstoppable. Unfortunately, none of this is nature focused. The recreation area across the river would seem to be the place for pump parks, skateboard parks, playgrounds, ball fields and parking. The little pond in wetland is a rare feature in Montpelier. If shy and sensitive wildlife such as hooded mergansers, wood ducks, and bitterns had adequate alternative locations, they would not be in this tiny spot. 
Despite the severely degraded condition, this is a wildlife hotspot in conjunction with a limited set of other sites. The pond slash wetland feature seems to have been mostly filled in filled by urban fill. I would call it a wetland fill violation. However, it probably happened back in the day and recently. The urban fill has been covered with the more recent layers of road sand, salt, contaminants of various types that accompany snow dumps, much like what flows down Finch Road from the stump dump in the spring, not likely to be a healthy place for any living thing. Three, heavy snows will occur again. I suspect that the city will be looking for snow dumps again. The site is also currently being used as a staging area for park maintenance. Four, the dreamy best outcome would be a wetland and floodplain restoration project. Far shy of that, can a 50 foot buffer distance from wetlands on the north, west and south sides of the project be flagged and protected for natural revegetation or possibly planting of native woody plants? Very difficult given the fill, deer and beaver. Five, the stream slash ditch wetland that connects from the vernal pool to the pond is an important resource slash pathway with cover for amphibians and other wildlife. This can be protected and could be enhanced. Six, parking is simply not needed. Put up no parking along the pump access dead end lane and direct people to park if needed at the recreation center. Let this be for actual kids if it is for actual kids. If parking is created, created an expectation will emerge for winter access. Seven, whose priority is this? Is there a commitment to support access for neighborhood children, access to bikes, repair, bike camp, or could the city find out what is needed by the residents in the adjacent neighborhood? I suspect that a pump track would not be the top item. If this is ac accessible to the neighborhood children and others, it needs to be visually connected to the apartments for supervision slash safety. Eight, can the proponents help to protect and plant the buffers? I have done part of my green up day loop in this area several times. The pump park will expand my circuit. Nine, this is a floodplain. It is best not to lose floodplain functions. It is possible, albeit difficult, to remove historic fill and restore some pond wetland floodplain function. 10, this is a river corridor. It is best not to lose room for the river. If the pump track ends up here, it will generate its own set of expanding needs and expectations. Can it be clearly limited by easement or permit to be a guest of the river? To not expand in footprint and hardness and to accommodate the North Branch if and when it shifts this direction. To not allow future riprap to stop the river, but rather to readily move the pump track. The dam below this site has a limited future. The North Branch may no longer be ponded at some point. Best wishes. Thank you for considering some of these social and natural resource elements of the review. Ned. All right. Thank Meredith. Thank you, Meredith. So before we move on to talking about parking and screening, um, I'd like to open this up for discussion of board members. You can share your impressions or questions um, on this requirement. I think we've heard a, a lot of good evidence on this um, that gives us a lot to chew on. Um, Definitely. I, I, um, yeah, Dean. I think it's important to get such feedback from those in the neighborhood, such as the the last letter. Um, you know, so the proposal shouldn't determine whether or not if there is a parking screening is needed or not needed. I mean, I think the neighbors feedback is essential when it comes to um, screening, especially if there's going to be a parking lot that might or a park that's going to get negative feedbacks from those residents in that area. Yeah, um, that's, Jean, that's a good thought. Um, if you wouldn't mind holding that thought and we're going to shift gears to the parking and screening in just a minute. Um, but good response to the letter. Um, anything else about the wetlands? I feel like we've heard a number of possible conditions that sound agreeable to the applicant. Um, I think we need to contemplate the snow storage area and whether this project affects how that area operates. Um, we have a good idea of where, where the impacts will be on the different buffers, and we've heard some ideas from the Conservation Commission about how those any impacts can be mitigated. Um, 
So I feel like I feel like this it is possible. I'm going to speak as one member that I think we're hearing ways that it would be possible for this project to meet the wetland and vernal pool standards. I think we have to be careful to make sure we focus on the the project itself and not a number of external factors that have been brought up uh, that really have nothing to do. Uh, with this, with this relatively low intensity uh, uh, project, I mean the, the land, the, the disturbance of the land happened long before this project is, was proposed, and it, it doesn't appear to me that it's going to increase in any substantial way. Uh, the, you know the the negative impacts that already exist. I just I just think it's really important for us to to step take a step back and realize we can't redesign the North Branch park i mean that's not what's happening here it's 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 a small project to take neighborhood kids and and give them a place to play other other thoughts or questions on the wetlands and vertical pools issue maybe give me a thumbs up if you think you have what you need to make a decision about this many thumbs all right, thank you. Um, I've never given so many thumbs up as I have since the Zoom zooming of our of our world began. All right, so I'm going to switch now, and we're going to talk about parking. Um, and as as I mentioned at the beginning, and Kevin alluded to just now, um, we are we're reviewing what's before us, um, not what um, not whether it should should be proposed or not. Um, so it sounds like. Um, I think if, if he's still available, I may have a question for John Holler, but Nolan may be able to answer it. Um, is it is it correct that there are a total of nine spaces being proposed? Yes. Thank you. And I think we've also received testimony that the pump track will not be in operation in the winter time, and so the it won't be the parking area won't be plowed, and there won't need to be snow storage. Is that also correct? That's correct. And also, I think the question of what the surface has been raised, it won't be paved. It would likely be the existing surface, perhaps crushed gravel. I guess if we raise the money to do that, but we haven't discussed that. Likely, it will be the existing surface. Okay. And have you done any design work? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's... I was wondering if you've done any um, design work to understand how uh, the drain drainage might work if that area becomes compacted by cars parking there. Well, my, uh, I mean, no, we haven't, I guess is the short answer. I, and my impression of that site is that it's heavily compacted by prior use. There's very little, I mean, I've been there in all seasons it's pretty dry and the soil is very compacted so i don't think and i've never seen standing water on that site so i don't think okay. drainage is going to be an issue okay before we you know related issue is the screening but do other folks have um questions or wish to discuss the um board members have questions or wish to discuss the parking You have a thought, Kevin? Well, I, I did just in general. I think the parking is a pretty modest parking lot. Um, and whereas there's been some testimony that a parking lot's not necessary at all, but what I would see that doing is creating a situation where you have cars randomly parked, not in any particular order or place, which could become a very jumbled type of type of type of use and and not look well as well as not function well uh, i think the uh, as proposed plan is a modest is a modest proposal and um john holler will there be um signage indicating where people should park so that um to, to deal with the circulation and things like that yes yeah, there will be signage. Great. Okay. Um, is everyone good on parking? We'll talk about screening next. Hey, Kate, can I just ask one question about the parking? Sure, Michael. 
is the the nine spaces is that just a function of the space available or is that a number that you came up with based on what you perceive the usage rate to be as a function of the space available my expectation is that it would rarely uh, reach that level i i I mean, we don't really know, but it just seems very yeah. unlikely that at any given time, you're going to have more than a couple of cars there. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to screening, and I don't have the reference in the staff report handy, but, and so Meredith might, uh, I'm going to say my understanding of the screening, and, and Meredith can correct me if I'm missing something. But um, landscaping and screening is a section in the zoning, and the purposes of that section include providing a landscape buffer between residential and non-residential land uses, and screening land uses and development that create visual clutter and distraction. Um, and oh, it's page 15 of the staff report that says screening applies when non-residential abuts residential, and I think more germane to our discussion, when parking areas are proposed. So I would, it is my sense that we're discussing the screening of a parking area more than we are, rather than discussing the screening of the pump track itself because of that purpose statement that it's about screening land uses and development that create visual clutter and distraction. I think it's, I don't think that the pump track is going to create visual clutter and distraction, but I think the part of our ordinance that says we but screening around parking is, is germane here. Um, Meredith, do you have anything to add about this section or you want to frame it up for us? Because I think this is our last thing to, to discuss. I, I don't know if I have any better framing than what you just gave here. I mean, there's, there's a lot of the time it's really in the past when we've dealt with these landscaping provisions, it's pretty cut and dry. You have to have landscaping, it needs to go there. In this instance, you know, the, the, there is that requirement for, um, you know, screening, applying for parking, the screening standards apply for parking areas. Um, hold on, let me just, give me a second, okay? Because I've, I've got my staff, I want to look at the actual full clause. Okay. Sure. Uh, well, Meredith, looking at that, do um, board members have any any opinions they want to offer on the on the screening based on your thoughts, your thinking on this, your review of staff report? I mean, I just would, I think one comment is that, you know, I've seen a number of these pump tracks around Vermont and, you know, it, most of them, it's not something where, you know, you have large numbers of people using for long periods of time, you know, I, I feel like it's this kind of thing where people come in for a short period of time and then, you know, go onto the trails and it's sort of like a warm up, like, you know, quick thing passing through. And so I think, I don't know, that seems relevant to the, the screening and the parking uh, um, and maybe some people that, you know, aren't so familiar with the, the use of a pump track would get a different, uh, you know, idea of it being more like a skateboard park or something like that. And my experience has been that, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're different. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Uh, that's a good point that Rob just made. So why, why have a parking lot? It, it, it's a it's a valid question. We've heard testimony that the parking lot is of interest to the applicant. It's um it's not really our prerogative to redesign the project. It's more that if they are asking for parking, how do we what how do we determine whether it meets or doesn't meet the standards? Can I, if I could just respond to that, I mean, this is not a high priority, but I do think it adds to the convenience. Let's say you have a six year old kid and you live in you know off of Terrace Street. Um, you're not going to ride bikes down from Terra Street or, or Town Hill Road to get to the pump track. Um, so it adds to the convenience of people who drive there. The DPW has raised concerns about parking along the access road. I think your um, 
the letter from the members of the parking commission or think uh, raised the question about why parking is so long there and we did explore that but they want to make sure that that remains open you know i think people could park along coming street it's just not ideal i think if people are driving to that site to use it that they ought to be able to park there i don't think it's going to be a, you know big demand that i'm hoping that people bike from town or people go to the rec center uh, of the pool or, or at the rec area and then say why don't we go over and bike for a little bit and i think uh Commissioner Goodwin's right. I don't think people are going to be there for a long period of time. So people are going to come and go. It's going to be a pretty transient area. But I think having parking there increases the convenience and accessibility, particularly for people with young kids. Thanks, John. So Meredith, you've, you've dug into the regs. Tell us what you found, please. So just to clarify for everybody what was in the staff report. So the language about um, screening this so the screening standards right apply for non-residential applications where the project abuts a residential property and then are the one we're really concerned about when parking areas are proposed or modified right so this is just an abbreviation of that provision so this is saying this is our trigger when the standards apply the standards then aren't necessarily things where you have to put in screening right the standards say that there's a performance standard that says screening shall be applied to minimize the visibility and impacts of incompatible, disruptive, or visually unappealing aspects of proposed development on the surrounding neighborhood. This is, you know, we get into what's in the language in here in staff report. This is not to be interpreted to mean that all views of the area or element to be screened shall be fully blocked. Rather, screening should be used to soften and break up views and to create visual interest elsewhere on the site so that the area or element to be screened no longer dominates the view. So it's not a, it's not a, the board has to decide that new screening needs to be added. It's a, does this situation where this new parking has come up and potentially a non-residential versus residential use has come up if that's what you're thinking about, has that created a situation where you have you know impacts from incompatible disruptive or visually unappealing aspects to this development that need additional screening versus what's there already I, that may not help you a whole lot but i think that's a different way to look at it maybe maybe that's a better explanation a more thorough explanation than what's in the staff report um it's sort of a two-step mm -hmm. process and these are standards to be applied not hard, fast rules about X, Y, and Z have to be there. Okay, thanks. That gives us a little bit of nuance and reminds us of the outcome that we're aiming for. The outcome is not X number of trees. The outcome is lessening the impact of a parking area, um, softening the impact, I think is the word that was used. Um, so as I view it, I think, I think we're best off talking about whether and how the parking area should be screened or softened, not the pump track. What do others think? Um, so oh. the, I unfortunately did not get to go to the site, even though I've been by there. Um, but um, on the easterly side of that road, the, the existing trail, so the, the, the apartment side of that, um, that road, is there vegetation um, there? So the screening, you know, is, it, is there already screening between the apartments and Kind of was where it's proposed or um is that just lawn on that trail um so can i if you look in your staff report on oh, page yeah. 16 um there's a photograph there that um is actually a photograph i took of the site where mm -hmm. i am about where the really where the pump track would be looking towards the coming street apartments um and you can see where there's a there's a tall tree that tall tree is on the other side of the current trail beginning of the trail so there's really tall grass and brush, brushy stuff now where the pump track would be where the parking lot would be and then between that space i think and where the 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 trail the trail might be it's right right there near that tree um and then there's some other tall i don't know if they're tall shrubs or short trees before you get to the um, 
houses. If you want me, I can do a share screen to show the picture. I don't know if that's sure. okay. So let's do that. And I can also, if need be, pull up a Google map. So that's a little old. You see that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh. Off there. So the trail runs through there. I think we lost that view in the wrong screen now. Did it go away? Yeah, we just had a blue background and one huh. PDF. Okay, so hold on, let me try again. There we go. Go off this side of that tree, right? I think it's the that's I think that's where the actual bike trail runs. Right. This side of the tree. So this tree and that screen is there. So I guess when I, I look at the photo based on my question. I don't, I, you know, I don't see uh, um, what you would be screening. Um, other than what's already there, but that's just me. Just the opinion of one board member. I have a question. So, from the research I've been doing on the Google Earth aerial maps, just before those townhouses there and adjacent to the bike trail, and it's on Palming Street. Um, there's it looks what it appears from the map because there's a car parked on it is a cut off off the coming street that looks like a parking area would that be a guest parking space for those apartments could maybe that be expanded since it's already there that's a private parking area it's private okay yeah yeah it's off the parcel it's not even on the same parcel right Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, my personal thoughts are that it doesn't seem like it really needs all that much screening, especially since they're not planning on doing anything other than just designating an area of this field as a parking area. That's what I gathered, at least. Um, it looks like there's already some shrubs and trees that provide some screening. We're not screening the actual pump track, so if, if occasionally there's a couple cars there for a short duration, I'm not sure that warrants the amount of effort that it would take to grow some mature vegetation there that would actually do the job of screening. So uh, I'm inclined to waive that responsibility, I suppose. That's something we're allowed to do. We could determine that the performance standard has been met by the existing condition. Um, yeah, then I, I guess own? I would like to say that. Okay. Um, my own feeling is that if we go from not having cars in that meadow-like area to having a few cars, that a few, a few bushes, something low-key to soften that impact would be appropriate. Um, it would not need to be, you know, 20 different kinds of trees and three different varieties so that you've got flowering at every different time of year, anything like that. I'm, I, the, the use of the word softening in the staff report, at least I heard that, yeah, soften and break up views. I feel like that can be done in a pretty um, low-key way that would ultimately benefit the site and, and hopefully not be too arduous. So that's, that's where I am at the moment. In a subtle way, I agree, Kate. I, I, after after examining this and reviewing, it, I think it's a great spot, and um, I think we should move forward. All right. All right. Is there any more discussion or questions about the issue of screening?
All right. Are there um, any any two minute comments from anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet? I guess that would be Nolan. If if you if you wanna if you if there's anything you wanna say, and then I'll ask John Holler if he has any concluding thoughts. I have nothing to add. Okay. Thank okay. Thanks, Nolan. Welcome. Um, and John, just any any last thoughts? A couple minutes worth, if you have them. I'm all set, I think. Um, I, you know, I keep saying that, and that's all right. Let me just say two things. One, this has a lot of public support. I know that's outside your purview, but we've had a GoFundMe campaign with a lot of community enthusiasm, so for what that's worth. And also that this has been through a pretty rigorous uh, scrutiny through the Parks Commission. So with that, I'm all set, so thank you. All right, thank you, John. All right. Um, I would like to, as I did with the previous application, I would like to propose that we that we deliberate on this in deliberative session, which is allowable under our um, under our procedures. It's a way for us to ensure the clarity around the permit conditions and make sure that we've covered all the bases. Um, if others agree, I would. I would request or entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I think that is, do, before I do that, do folks feel like they have enough information to make decisions? Okay. In that case, I would, I'd be interested in a motion to close the public hearing for the Cumming Street Pump Track application and move into deliberative session at the conclusion of this public portion of tonight's meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. Okay. Second by Rob. Um, I'm going to go through and have people vote. Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Jean. Yes. Roger. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Rob. Yes. Uh, Michael. Yes. Hey, and I also vote yes. Um, so what that means is you heard with the previous application is that we will we will deliberate and then issue a written written decision. Um, we are doing this for the sake of quality deliberation, um, not because there are red flags waving all around. Um, so I want to provide that assurance that you've heard a lot of our thinking and we'll just do the final bit. Uh, thank you very much for participating. All right. So moving on to the next item of our agenda, I want to make sure there's nothing before we go into deliberative session. Um, other business. Our next meeting is a Tuesday because it's the day after Labor Day or usual meetings on Labor Day. It's going to be September 8, 2020. And um, that means we are not having our second August meeting, so uh, everybody enjoy yourself, get some R&R &R in the sun, um, especially Meredith, who's, actually, who's doing a good job by taking a break from vacation. Um, I will be absent from the September 8th meeting, but Kevin has um, kindly agreed to share, share the meeting that evening. Um, are there, is there any, any other, other business before we move into deliberative session? Meredith. Uh, just a quick note that I have just emailed everybody an invitation to a separate Zoom meeting for the deliberative session, um, just so that we don't accidentally have people trying to log into this late and waiting in the waiting room and not knowing what's going on. Okay. Thank you. Everybody keep an eye out for that. Um, and Meredith, can folks call you at your desk if they don't get that Zoom invite? Okay, and that, that number is on the website. That's right. in our Let's that's in our it. email, Meredith. Yeah, I just so I sent it as an Outlook invitation. Okay, very good. Yep. Okay, so um, let's take a ten minute break and return at eight forty to deliberate. And we'll be deliberating in the net in the in the deliberative session Zoom. Yes, that's right. Okay, so we can close out of here. We yeah. can. Okay. Um, do we need a motion to adjourn? I think you need a motion yeah, we do. To public meeting and move to deliberative session. That's what we need to do. Is there yes. a motion to adjourn the public here, the public meeting, and move into deliberative session? I'll move. Motion Second. by Joe. 
Second by Roger. Second by Roger. All right. Um, to vote, please, Joe. Yes. I think Kevin? the motion was by Rob, yes. not by me. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Friendly amendment from the person who didn't actually make the motion. Motion by Rob, um, the second by Roger. And voting yes so far, we have Joe and Kevin. Um, Jean? Yes. Um, Roger? Yes. Uh, Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I also vote yes, this meeting is adjourned and we will reconvene in deliberative session using the Zoom just sent to us at 8.42. Thank you. See you then. See you then. Anybody have their email open and have seen it? Go ahead. Uh,